Okay, Command 12. As we've continued to move through the teachings of our Lord, He calls His disciples, and what the word disciple means is what? What does disciple actually mean? Follow? Believer? What else? More to it. Servant? Okay, more to it. What else? Learner. What kind of learner? Discipline learner, servant, and so forth. There is a combination of ideas, but the discipline learner is the idea that cores all the things you said, Keith. And what does it mean then to be a disciplined learner? What does that mean? There's probably casual learners, and there's disciplined learners. What's the difference? Okay, and what were you going to say, Mom? You forget? Do what you learn? Okay, now there's, when, you, when people go to college, you go there disciplined to get a degree. You work, you strive, you do, it's, it's discipline. Now, if you go there and hang out with your friends, you're not a disciplined learner, you're just a... Casual. Some people, uh, they, uh, what do they call it? They um, visit the class, but they don't really audit the class, but they don't really participate. Audit's a lot more laid back. Discipline is really digging in. And what I want you to see is nobody wants to dig in anymore, hardly. <laughs> we don't want to be disciplined Christians that dig in and do what God says, hardly. It's more like I want to be casual Christian. I want to come hear a sermon, feel a little better, say you who worship a little bit, and go home. And it's got to be done in you know, a set amount of time or else I don't like it. So that whole mentality is not disciplined learners anymore. But God is looking for those few that really want to, to become a part of uh, seeking Him and being a part of His life. And so that's what this kind of this whole concept today is when we look at this number 12 command give pray fast secretly because God who sees in secret shall reward you openly and the key to this thing has to do with the secrecy and that doesn't mean like a spy it doesn't I mean the point is that you don't go around sneaking around and hiding in closets And that's your religion. That's not what it's saying. And I think some people misunderstand the idea when it says secret. That's what they're talking about. God is the person we're seeking. And we're doing it for his sake, not for recognition out here. And when we do that, he does reward you openly for your true seeking heart after him. And that's the idea. So let's build on that as we look at the scripture. Now, I'm going to quote from the message and it's worded a lot different than your King James or whatever so you might want to follow up here because I want to get a whole fresh thought through this it's a well-known passage it also gives the Lord's Prayer a lot of us memorize it and it becomes automatic boom 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 and a lot of times our minds boxed into that we don't really think through the concept this version the message brings out a lot of the ideas of the Greek and the feeling of it and I want you to kind of look up here as we read through it together watch up here Be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. Notice it's the idea of going to a show. And it says, when you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action. I'm sure play actors, I call them, treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage, acting compassionate as long as someone is watching, playing to the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it, quietly and unobtrusively. That is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out and when you come before God don't turn that into a theatrical production either all these people making a regular show out of their prayers 
hoping for stardom. If you follow the way TV and stuff like uh, um, a lot of people are into the desire to be stars or famous. It's obsessive these days in our culture. And it kind of it can even go to this way here where pastors want to be in a church where there's their stars and and it's a it's a real temptation to not do these kind of things and they'll switch to another one to try to get famous or be on tv and you see a lot of these guys on tv lately are in the negative sense as they're stars but they're not stars they're negative stars they put a crunch on the name of the church and god until the point where now you're hearing god's name being reproached by politicians and everything else as if we all do the same thing as these men that were well known it's definitely not a good thing in the box here or in the in the in the sign of being a star do you think god sits in a box seat watching you absolutely not does he here's what i want you to do find a quiet secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before god just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage the focus will shift from you to him, to God. And you will begin to sense his grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice. Peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Go watch the Christian channels. You'll see this peddling going on a lot. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you are dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simple, like this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Show me your... Set the world right. Do what's best, as above, so below, as you do in heaven, as you do here. I want as best here as, as you have up in heaven is what I desire. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. You know that, that's what amen means? It's that positive yes, 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 yes. I'm, in other words, there's a feeling to it. There's an impact. People that get into some church and they go, Amen! And that's kind of the idea because it's that, Yes, I agree with this. Yes, I agree with this. Yes! And you start getting kind of excited about it. The feeling and impact is here. The zeal is there is the idea behind it. Verse 14 says, In prayer there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving those who hurt you verse 15 if you refuse to do your part you cut yourself off from god's part you cannot cut yourself off you've got to do what you're told to do first verse 16 when you practice some appetite denying discipline to better concentrate on god don't make a production out of it now this is the idea of what's called fasting right when you practice appetite denying in other words you don't eat a meal or whatever this is a discipline because your body wants it and you're disciplining yourself and say i'm not going to be controlled by this i'm going to seek god it says to better concentrate on god don't make a production out of it it might turn you into a small time celebrity but it won't make you a saint if you go into training inwardly act normal outwardly i felt that way this week when i saw a video live coming out of washington dc at a at a conference for the uh, family christian thing a guy got up and started talking and all he talked about was he did this fast and he got this and somebody else did this fast and they had these visions and he went on and on like a production almost and i just started feeling i turned it off i just felt funny about everything that was being done with it um notice it says it might turn you into a small time celebrity he kind of got well known i guess for this kind of thing but the fact is if you go into training inwardly, act normal outward. Don't make everybody know how spiritual you are for doing all these things. And then it even explains, he says, you know, shampoo and comb your hair. Brush your teeth, wash your face. In other words, don't come out of there going, oh, I've been fasting <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm seeking God. What do you want from me today? I can't really do a lot here, you know. Don't make a big deal about it. Hide it, basically. 
God doesn't require attention-getting devices. He won't overlook what you're doing. He'll reward you well for just seeking Him. Now, all of this is important because it's got to do with why in secret. What, what does it mean to be in secret? Why does God want this kind of thing? Well, God, good works is not for public recognition. For example, if my wife buys me a birthday present, her motive isn't so she can get out here in front of the church on Sunday and say, I bought my husband a present. What do you think about me? I'm pretty generous, huh? You know what? It's private. She bought me a gift because she loved me. This is what we're trying to get you to see. This is what God's trying to get with this whole idea. The secrecy has nothing to do with being secret agents. It's got the idea of your motivation. Are you trying to get people to think you're some kind of spiritual giant? Or are you seeking him because you love him? This is the key idea here. He's trying to say good works is not for public recognition so that people will step in back and say, wow, you're a generous giver. This is why we don't sit there and want everybody to know what kind of money you give in the offering plate. Your offering is between you and God because you love him. It's not so you can say, well, I gave, you know, 13000 last year for Jesus. What'd you give? Hmm? What'd you give? That's arrogance. And if you do that, what do you get? Your own reward is think people thinking, wow, he's pretty generous. But you just lost all your contact because you just basically told God, I don't really love you. I was doing all of this for me, me, me to get known. And so that happens a lot. It's called advertising. Businesses do that all the time. You know, <laughs> it's all it is, is advertising. And it's not to get admiration either from people who think, wow, I wish I was like him. Now, number two, the motivation is for God's eyes only. Hey, my wife and I go in our house and close our doors. We don't open up all our windows so everybody watches this. Now, I know TV people do this, but privacy is the idea that there's friendship. It's for us, not for everybody else. It's for me and, you, and me and my wife. I don't want everybody watching what I'm doing. I can't help it. I don't like that. And God doesn't like it. He wants you to be connected to him. Um, friends and family do things out of love for each other. God wants you as his friend not as a show or a religious thing. He's looking for true, solid, good friendship with us. That's what he's after. And we got to break the barrier and see that that's what he's after, a true relationship. Now, John 15, 15 makes this clear. Jesus, as he was talking to his disciples after being with them for a while, <coughs> he tells them this, I do not call you slaves any longer, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you my friends. Notice the difference. Because I've made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. I have revealed to you everything that I have learned from Him. What is friendship about? Telling each other secrets. Being, you know, ask girls. Girls are into that, right? They want friendships and they're best friends and they tell each other secrets. It's, it's a personal, relational thing that God's after with us. He isn't a after us to be a form this is what scares me about the, the idea that coming to church is so you have the form and the sound and the feel and the sacredness and have smoke going with candles and blah, 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 as if all this stuff has... None of this has anything to do with friendship. Friendship is face-to-face -face connect. And that's what you do when you close the door secretly together. You get close by being friends. And God is more interested in the friendship relationship than all the outward religion that America can create. He gave three disciplines to keep us focused on him through this command. These are helping us get our eyes on the right person for the right reason and dependent upon his power and strength to live our lives and to have response. He wants to give us his life and his relationship and share with us his blessing. And so those three are give secretly, pray secretly, and fast secretly. And your Father which sees in secret will and shall reward you openly and plenteously, or however you want to say that, with blessing. So the three ideas all mesh into one concept or one command here, even though it takes 18 verses of description from Scripture. So let's <coughs> think of give secretly. Here's a quote from Bill Gothard. If we are totally honest with ourselves, 
most of us would admit that giving can often be motivated by the anticipated gratitude of the recipient rather than by the purely and selfish motive of obedience to God's prompting to give. Tell me why parents love to give presents to their kids. Tell me why grandparents love to give presents to their kids. A lot of the time, it's because it makes them feel good. Their, their little kids hug them and they're all excited and they're so grateful and they want to do it again because it's mo- so much fun. They take movies of them doing this and they want to watch it over and over again. And it's something great about feeling accepted and loved because they are so accept- you know, they so like what you give them, right? All of that is common. But you see, when it comes to God, he says, I want you to be like me. And God gives for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. He gave us life. He creates us. He's not interested in feeling all bubbly when everybody says, Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. He wants to give because His love is there. Secondly, He tells us Christians to give secretly so that He gets the blessing and glory, not us. And that's hard. Right? And so that's where back in the Jewish time, remember what they did? They'd go to the temple to give their donations, and they'd have pots or flat metal things there, and and people would intentionally bring coins and bags of money, and they would go bang. They literally threw them down to make it bang through the temple. So everybody would look up and say, well, that's a generous giver. They literally did it out of arrogance and pride to get recognition. And so when Jesus, you know, when he said, oh, look, look at this little widow. Because she went up and had a little tiny coin this big and placed it on there. It didn't make any noise. And he noticed her while everybody else was getting noticed for all the banging and clanging of all the money they were throwing there. She got no notice, but he, God, said, Oh, look, this little widow's given more than all the rest. Because out of her poverty, she has sacrificially showed she loves me. These people are advertising. This big merchant came in, and he's the guy that sells all the cows. And he said, playing, and everybody said, oh, I'm going to buy my cows from that guy next week. He's such a good Jewish uh, follower of God. He's, he's authentic, and so forth. But not the little widow. God says, I want you to be able to give secretly so that you give by purely unselfish motives of obedience as God tells you to give. And then, who gets the glory? This is why it's important to do things like don't go and give things in your name. Put your donation secretly in the church and let the church give it. Then who gets the glory? God's kingdom instead of you personally. Where otherwise you say, well, I, I give money to orphanages and I give money. To, and everybody knows what you do, you know, and you're kind of generous. The second is pray secretly. When we pray in a group, It is easy to become more concerned about how we feel people hear us, how we sound. Is our praying sound professional, spiritual, Baptistic, or uh, King Jamesy, or unKing Jamesy? How do we sound? We're worried about what we sound like. Guess what? When you're in the closet, God could care less what you sound like, does He? It gets down to real friendship. See, all this has got to do with God getting real with you and you getting real with Him. And this is why he says to pray in secret. He doesn't mean you don't pray in groups. We, he orders you in other places to pray as a church. But he, what he's saying is, I want you to get real with me. And that takes off. And some people can't get real unless they stay away from a group until they can pray without <coughs> being afraid of what they sound like. <coughs> so many people are so worried about, oh, I can't pray out, out loud because I don't pray like Keith does. You know, or something like that. I don't pray like Cheryl does, so I can't pray out loud. As if that matters. Praying means that we call out to our God. Thirdly, fasting has got to be done secretly. As we fast, it's impossible for us to become more conscious of the admiration of people and the approval of God. When you understand the concept of fasting, it's got to do with desperation to receive from God something that normally you don't receive. Remember when the disciples were dealing with some wicked people and people that are demonized and they couldn't accomplish anything they finally called jesus and he came and he helped the person that was being oppressed by the devil do you remember what jesus said 
Anybody remember what was said? Yeah, he said, this group, they're so evil, they so hurt people, these people will not be delivered and free and blessed except for when you, my disciples, pray desperately to the point of even fasting for their spiritual change. I get frustrated watching people that don't change. How about you? They seem like no matter what we do to share the Word with them, they still are in bondage to their sin. They still don't make any difference. They're still broken by the devil, ruined by the devil. And this caught me this week when it said, remember, some of these don't change until prayer and desperate prayer and fasting are done for these people. And then they can get freedom. Wow. See how important it is then when we talk about this, this whole area. It's not just to, be a, to, just to pray to pray, not just to fast to fast. It's for a purpose, to diligently go after the living God and His will. If the goal is recognition, that is all you're going to get. God says, go ahead, you're going to get your blessing from those people, and I'm not going to answer you anyway. I'm going to ignore you. If you feel ignored, this could be an important point we need to look at in our evaluation of ourselves today. Number one, this is considered by God to be lukewarm. I never really connected lukewarmness until as I was looking through the scripture today. Actually, this morning, this, caught, this one point caught me this morning as I was re-looking. Being considered lukewarm is something that God hates. And in the book of Revelation, it says, you that are lukewarm, he's going to literally vomit. He, it, we make him uh, uh, sick to the point if we're lukewarm. And you think, well, what's lukewarm? Well, Hmm? Yeah, he would prefer that at least if you're cold, you'd be convicted of your sin. If you're hot is what he's really after, you'd be seeking him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which we talk about. But if you don't do that in a realistic thing and it's just talk, it becomes lukewarm. And that lukewarmness is the thing that people will do. If they give so that people are praise and worship so that people will notice, uh, that's, God considers that lukewarm. If it's you pray because you want or you give or whatever for that self-recognition or whatever, that's what's lukewarm. And that's really where your sin is. In Revelation 3, 17 says, you do not realize and understand that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. That's a horrible place to be. Can you imagine if you're standing out there in the street naked and you don't know it? <clears throat> I mean, usually we would really notice that and be embarrassed. And that's what he's saying, that when you come to a point where you're so full of it that you're doing praise and worship to make yourself feel better, when you're, when you're doing your giving so you get recognized, and when you're doing your preaching so, if, so preachers can get more well-known as if that's a, that All that stuff really shows how wretched and naked and blind you are. You're lukewarm. And yet you could be a famous preacher in America on TV. You could be a well-known singer in the choirs or recording artist. You could do all this kind of stuff, and you would be classed as lukewarm because you received your goal. You got your recording contract. You made your money. You wrote your book. You did this and that. But it's fame and fortune is not what God's after. See? And so this whole thing, even in a smaller level that we may be in, if that's our focus... Our focus is we want our church to grow so that we can feel and then the other guys will realize how good we are. Spiritual. Hey, did you notice Del Rio has 3,000 people? Wow, what a growing church they are. Is that going to make us feel, woohoo, we made it. Yeah, 100, 30, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the steps go, but I'm saying the goals. You know, hoo hoo. But see, all that's got to do with ripping it right here. You can do all that for the wrong motive, and your class is lukewarm. Going that way to try to become recognized will put you in the place where God says, I can't stand it. No wonder he would be resistant. If the goal is to seek God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, he will make himself known to us whole different story this is his promise jeremiah 29 13 you shall seek me and find me 
when you shall search for me with all your heart. Now that's getting in the closet and getting out of the closet. That's fighting after God, chasing after God, fasting after God, trying to get a response and not content with a nothing response, the, the status quo, or watching it just go downhill. We have to get to a place and say, this city hasn't moved in how many years we've been here. They still are 96% or 94% resisting God. There's no movement or change. Well, some only come out by fasting and desperate prayer. And all the stuff around it's not going to make that much of a difference. The command to practice godly discipline secretly is for the purpose of focusing on God's approval rather than on man's praise. I guarantee you if we had, if something happened here where we suddenly had 200 people by the end of the year, guess who would praise us? The Southern Baptist Convention. Right now they don't have any praise for us because we're worthless. But if we had 200, we'd be praised. What would we do? We'd have to be careful, wouldn't we? First of all, we've been so dead for so long with so few, we would really say, <laughs> you think we did something to make this happen? God did a miracle because otherwise we would never get anywhere. We have been brought to humility so that he can be glorified. Or if we think we planned it, we got enough money to advertise, we brought in enough singers to make it so people would come here because we had the best singers in the land, the people would come for all the things we planned and organized and worked, and it would be like any business saying we succeeded. But we couldn't say, well, God did this, right? Because we did it. We, we planned it and schemed it and worked it and bought it and shaped it and advertised it and got our, you know, all those kind of things. But the one thing is that when we practice secretly and call on God, they won't see us do anything and God gets the glory and we don't get it. Psalm 27, 4. One thing I've desired, one thing I've desired of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. The one thing that we seek is God. That's it. One thing we seek. And if we can truly get to that place, well, what God does will be, He says He rewards openly, doesn't it? God's goal for fasting then is to loose the bands of wickedness, not get us fame. Well, what bands of wickedness? And the people around who are suffering under Satan's power. To undo the heavy burdens that people are under from the, the cost of their sins. And to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Imagine the idea that we're seeing here that people are still in bondage of sin. God wants us to fast then, to get desperate to Him for, for a change. Fasting adds intensity to our search for God. We say we seek Him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but what if we add intensity to our search? What if we add intensity to our desire? God, <coughs> we can't live with this atmosphere of wickedness around us. We can't live watching our neighbors still go to hell no matter how hard we've tried to tell them about Jesus. We can't stand to watch them ignore us as we invite them to the kingdom. We can't stand it. We need you to do a miracle. And it gets intense before us and God. Fasting adds intensity to our search for God, our study of His Word, and our sincerity of faith. How sincere are, us, are we when we surrender to God and when we desire His will? How intense is it? We know and have to believe that only God can do the simple thing of saving sinners. No matter what we do, it won't change their hearts. Only God converts people, right? And so His hand has to come down. If it does not, we're not going to make any difference. Here are some basic ideas to ask you to personalize this and think it through in your life as before we take communion. First of all, personalized ideas, I will not seek the praise of others as I do good works. I will not try to get a slap on the back, a thank you from the pastor, 
uh, recognition up front, a plaque from the church, whatever. I will not seek or even feel bad that I don't get it. Because I see a lot of people do that, right? I did all that and nobody even said thank you. I'm not going to help anymore. That just proved that your, your whole motive was for that recognition instead of to please glorify God. This is why we have to personalize. This goes deep into the hearts of many of us. I'll not seek the praise of others as I do good works. I will seek to remain anonymous in giving to others. The best way to do that is to give it through somebody else. The best way to do it is give it through the church and let the church do it for you so you do not get seen by men. Also, I will remove anything that distracts me during my private time with God. Don't have your cell phone on when you say you're seeking God. Take your cell phone and either turn it off or throw it someplace where you can't hear it. Throw it out the door for a while and close your door. But make sure you're not distracted. Make sure you turn off the TV. Make sure your uh, uh, spouse isn't hungry and want dinner. And you're going to try to go as if, and they're yelling, I'm hungry, fix dinner. You know, you got to take away all distractions. If you honestly are obsessed over this. Now, I think back when Cheryl and I were first met, we get on the phone and not say a whole lot for a long time. Remember that initial? We'd been on the phone for a half hour or more, but we didn't say a whole lot, but we were just connected. You know, the connection. Connecting with God. Let nothing break from me because I'm busy. I have a desire to be with my God is what he's after. I will obey and follow the directives God gives me during my private time with him. This is something that is very important. Do you, once you're there, you know, a lot of times I get insights from Scripture, and if I don't write them or type them in the computer so I can remember, I forget. Well, if I forget, I don't comply, and don't comply, I don't obey, and I don't follow through. So I try to, as quickly as I can, when things are starting to stir in me from God, I try to, to get them down so that I can keep going back to them. And I got piles of notes and scribbles, and there are things all over my desk and everything, because I just... I know I forget I'm getting old. I don't know. My brain doesn't work. But I need to remember, and I keep sensing things, and so I need to follow those directives of God. That's what got me into to going on the Internet. I didn't go on there for the purpose thinking I'd get, you know, 100,000 people go to our website. I was trying to prepare myself, trying to fulfill what God kept telling me even though I didn't see the vision he was showing us he wanted us to go that way and I did it in spite of what people understood because I kept sensing God say this is your direction go this way go this way okay the same way you need to spread yourself to do what God says don't worry about other people you're not trying to please others are you if you tr- no try to please one person God yeah No, no, I'm not, no, you're misunderstanding. We're, oh, okay, we're talking about when you make a decision. Am I going to do this because uh, I'm worried about what my neighbors think, or am I going to do this because I'm only worried about God? Yeah, I, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to, you know. That, that's what we're talking about here. This is why we go into the place of praying even to fasting, begging God to change their minds because we can't personally change their minds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she doesn't want to seek God, exactly. That's why we pray for her instead. Uh, I will do what I can to keep my fasting secret for the Lord. To begin to show your desperate concern. And, and the only way I can illustrate this would be like for a mom to realize when your child is deathly sick. Suddenly, food is not important. You're by the bed. You're next to them. You're pacing the floor. You're crying to God. Days go by. Oh, I forgot to eat for two days. The desperate intensity of your prayers, you naturally 
fast until you see your child get well, right? That's what he's trying to get here in a simple way. When you don't do fasting just because, oh, I, I, I read in the Bible, you might as well fast. No, it's an intensity. It's a desperation that comes, and that most of us don't have that intensity or desperation, so we don't naturally fast. I will use fasting to seek God's power in turning away reproach on his name. In other words, the very thing we're, we were saying here earlier about pastors or false teachers getting, getting famous and well-known, and they ruin God's name, this is where we should start to fall before God and say, oh no. For example, <clears throat> uh, go back to the story of Daniel. They were commanded by the king, I had a dream, now all of you are going to tell me what it, what it means or else I'm going to kill you. Now that can get you real intense real fast. Your life's in order. So it, scripture doesn't say that Daniel sat down and worked out a plan of how he was going to learn how to, to read dreams. It says that he sought God diligently and asked God to give him the answer to the dream. Because he knew he didn't have any way to naturally do this. He was desperate and fasted, it said, for him to receive God's answer, his revelation. Well, obviously he was motivated because he was going to be killed if he didn't. And so his motivation was helped to seek, but the seeking became very relevant to the point where I don't think these other guys did not eat. They tried everything, made up their own answers. They came to the king trying to tell him all these stupid things, and he was mad at him because he could tell it wasn't true, and he was very unhappy. Where Daniel received the answer. And what Daniel did was he went to the king and said, Listen, I want you to know that there's only one true God. And he is the one who gave me the answer to your dilemma. So I'm going to share this to you because I'm giving it to you so my God will be glorified. He didn't say, I want to get glory. I've got the answer. Now what are you going to give me for, this, for answering this? When it was done, even the king said, now I know there is one true God and it's Daniel's God. Look at the glory that happened. This is what we're talking about here. Seek by fasting God's power in turn to t turn away the reproach against his name. God's name got high and lifted up above all the other gods because of what Daniel did in praying and fasting, seeking his will. It stopped the mouth of the haters of God, and even this wicked king began to realize and respect that there was only one true God. That's amazing. That's what we're saying here. God's reputation's at stake in America right now. He's getting slammed. He's getting cut down. He's being charged with all kinds of false things. They're attacking the, his name through preachers and whatever. This is a time of our day that we need to seek God so his name will be glorified and not reproached by the masses who are out here hating him. See what I'm saying? It's an important time that we take notice. Also, another idea for you to ponder. I will seek creative ways to serve those in authority. The idea of doing it secretly is that you go and help the other person and your boss or your authority gets the glory, you don't get it. For example, going to the mayor. Churches, I've, I've read of some churches doing this. They go to the mayor of their city and say, what's the greatest need you have? What is really bothering you now for the city or you're struggling with, you don't have answers for? And they would tell them, there's a whole section, some, like one church was told there was some poor kids or whatever that couldn't get helped, or they always have secular concerns they have. But these, these churches went back and said, okay, here's what the mayor said. So they went to this neighborhood that was a poor neighborhood, and they made up flyers, and they said, <coughs> the mayor has commissioned us to come through and help you. Uh, and we have painters, people who will rake your yard, We'll have, we have people help clean your home today. Is there anything we can do because the mayor has sent us? Notice they didn't even come in the name of Jesus. They came to glorify the mayor, their authority. By doing that, and that's what Daniel did. Think about it. It says he worked hard for the king Nebuchadnezzar. And even though he worked hard for the king, God rewarded him openly, and God still got the glory. But he did it not in his own name, or even sometimes he didn't even do it in the name of God. He did it for the sake of Nebuchadnezzar. And as some of the churches have learned this, they seek creative ways to serve those in authority 
obviously what happened from that city when this church helped these people and all the people in this neighborhood were calling up the mayor and saying mayor thank you for being so caring for us that mayor really liked that church <laughs> they he didn't find the, the christians down there boycotting him and tell him he's a sinner they he said man this church is amazing they they made me so popular in this whole section i i've never been able to have these people vote for me before he thought it in a selfish way and the church blessed him the poor and god was glorified well guess what happened to that church when they needed to expand what the mayor say give them anything they want <laughs> he immediately blessed them openly they were blessed for what they found by doing something in secret you, you understand the concept here what it means to be in secret it doesn't mean you secretly don't do it but you do it so you don't receive your own glory or praise for it exactly I will do good works in order for God to get the most glory and those churches that did these kind of things that I read about and heard other people talk about there's a, there's a church uh, in Texas it's called the Second Baptist Church of is it Houston is that the well-known these people were interesting too they got a hold of this idea and uh, they stopped advertising and paying for billboards I mean they're a big church but they stopped advertising and saved a lot of money and then they said okay now when people have needs we're gonna help them we're gonna stop trying to get people to come here we're gonna go help them so they would find people that had needs and they would go with their resources and help the poor help those who needed it they'd find other churches they found a little church that needed help and they gave them like fifty thousand dollars to because i think i forget what all happened but they gave them like fifty thousand dollars to help the and completely got them out of debt you know we felt that blessing before right here but they blessed they got guess what happened they were so famous in their area he went to a little league the pastor went to a little league baseball game like 10 miles away from their place for some league thing or whatever and he was sitting there and a stranger came up to him a lady and said aren't you from that church that that shows love to everybody <laughs> he said I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I am from second baptist yeah you're the ones I want to let you know something and she went on and on and on and on and glorifying God of how they blessed so-and-so and he didn't even know who they were he, he they, their their blessings so flowed around them that people miles away glorified God because of their simple action to obey this command to secretly give and pray and fast for the glory of God hear what it is so let's say it out loud together as we finish this idea we do it give pray fast secretly and God who sees in secret shall reward you openly Matthew 6 1 through 18 let's pray father I ask you now to make the application real in our lives before we take communion we want to apply the ideas we want to reflect on their meanings. We want to take action personally so that you would be glorified. I pray that you would speak to our hearts now as we reflect. Convict us, push us, mold us, and move us. For your namesake, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.